Okay, I hope my sound is better now. Thank yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. So, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, we will just see some examples and uh, and see the implementation details of flowcharts. Uh, because as you could see that uh, uh, there is really there is a very simple uh, form of flow chart that is uh, if we just form a kind of uh, decision tree but in many cases uh, we want to model more difficult uh, things so uh, if uh, you are thinking about programs where I have statements uh, I can uh, I can show the control flow of the programs of the different statements so if I have two statements after each other then I will definitely be able to just uh, uh, depict in a, in a process model but in programs we can have if expressions uh, that will become branches uh, in state charts so uh, they have they have equivalent uh, they are equivalent so just different uh, representation of the same thing so whenever the expression holds i will execute the statement otherwise I will not uh, execute the statement so I might also have an else part in the statement so according if the expression holds uh, then I will execute statement one if the expression fails then I will go to this part that is the else uh, branch so what to do with while expressions you have, if i have a while expression then that means that while the expression is true i will do the statement so whenever the expression fails then i will just uh, go out from my while loop otherwise i will execute the statement go back and the expression again here so these kind of while expressions are also expressible with the help of uh, process models and uh, there is another uh, control flow that is the do while loop uh, so we can also do this do while loop that will means that will uh, just uh, mean that okay I will go to execute my statement while my ex expression is true and when the expression is true i go back to here otherwise i finish so you can see that uh, these constructs are easy to express with the help of uh, process models or this way a process model can be uh, expressed uh, with a programming like language so you can just transform them to each other actually that doesn't mean that all the process models uh, we can transform to uh, to programs because whenever I have such a statement such facts inside uh, inside the next which I express in the programming language then okay then means that I have a higher level model so I will definitely uh, not be able to easily express it as uh, uh, in, in, in any of the programming languages but the control structure uh, we have the same uh, expressive power uh, in process model just to show you a more complex example here 
where I have while A doesn't equal B, uh, and I have all these things inside, uh, I will go through how to put it into a process model. So at first, I have everything in one uh, one activity, one big activity. Actually, I can do that. And anyway, that is also a correct process model. If I don't want to detail what is inside, then I can use it. But I can just put this return state to another uh, task, to another activity. And uh, by using the rules I, I showed you before, I can also extract the while loop here, if you remember the rules that I, uh, I had for while. So I just, I just execute this part if A doesn't equal B, otherwise I stop this loop. So, and if A doesn't, doesn't equal B, then I go back. So this is this was the construct that we uh, we saw before, but here there is an if statement, and we also know how to express if statements uh, in the process models. So if we want, we can further detail. So if uh, a is bigger than B, then I will just go into this direction. And otherwise, if uh, A is less or equal, equal B, then I will execute this part. So this is just when I went to the different branches. So why, why, why should I do all these things? Because I have a programming language and and uh, and it's 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 quite easy to understand it's easy to use uh, at first i just wanted to show you that okay this kind of uh, control logic can be expressed in uh, in process models and by knowing these uh, best practices uh, you can construct even either your high level process models or you can apply this uh, knowledge to express something in a low level in the implementation level but by using this graphical and graph based representation we can answer uh, analysis questions uh, such as uh, the cycle automatic complexity Address, uh, sorry, you, your Mickey is fading away again. Okay, I just set my batteries, so maybe my microphone is not working. So I expect that now you hear me. Yes, we can hear now. Oh, great. So let's go back to the slides. So, why I show this? Uh, please, if uh, because I don't see the chat, so please, if I fade away, just uh, tell me, uh, and then I immediately try to do something. Okay. So, uh, what is nice in this figure is that we have this graph based representation with nodes, edges, and so on, and we can use it. Uh, to answer questions such as the cyclochromatic complexity. I do not know if you ever heard about that, but it's a quite nice thing. I just brought this example because it defines us the number of linearly independent paths. Why is it important? Because if I want to do testing, and I want to test the paths, the different paths in the execution, then I need to know how many tests I need. And I need to know what to test in my program and what I have already tested. So whenever you move from the source code to this graph-based representation, you are able 
to answer many, many new questions. And actually, one more thing is that uh, I will show some examples also for uh, formal verification. The, whenever you use formal verification, you will also work in these uh, kind of representation, not completely this, but similar representations, because uh, you can just put them in. So this is a graph, and this is much more mathematical representation than just the code itself. Uh, so now you, you saw a simple example to represent complex contour flow. And, and also we saw that how it can be used for various purposes. But I, will, I also want to show you uh, how we can uh, represent recursion. So whenever I have a recursive function, like the computation of factorial. Actually, let's see this uh, implementation just uh, for the sake of, sake of simplicity because it's easier to uh, represent. Then I can represent recursive programs also uh, and recursion with the help of process models. So if you consider that uh, this program, then if I put it into process model, it will look like this. And what is important is that the really strong point is here. If you remember this arrow sign here, this just represents that I will call the fact function, the fact process again. So I will just have the whole process here inside. So everything is quite similar to that what you uh, what I showed you before because there is decision merge and some basic operations. Uh, but this is the key point is that I can recursively call the function again. And just to show some uh, more more complex example, uh, with the, so this is an example of n choose k, which is uh, we divide into parts. So if uh, zero choose zero, this is one, and otherwise I will just do the sum of these two. Uh, and choose K. And I can also represent this one. And what you can see here is that I saw some kind of parallelism here. So whenever I, I just depict it in a process model, I see that, okay, uh, these two steps that I have here, Uh, this sum, actually, I can uh, execute them uh, in a parallel way. And you can see that they will just call this n choose k function again. So they will both uh, call this whole uh, function this whole process again. So this way uh, you can see that I can express uh, all these uh, important things of programming that I can uh, make parallelism, uh, loops, if then else, and so on. So it's these process models, they are very, very uh, they are very, very strong formalism. So uh, now I finish uh, talking about uh, process models uh, because I also wanted to tell you some uh, best practices and some uh, uh, 
some parts of verification and validation. So I will just share other presentation, just a moment. Oh, great. So now I will uh, talk about why it is important not just to model, but uh, to create good models and correct models. And I will just show some example how one can use these models to improve the processes and improve the quality uh, of your systems. So, uh, I will just show you a motivating example. I'm sure that many of you have already heard about the RN5 booster. So that was the stronger, strongest Europe, European booster. So they wanted to put some uh, satellites, I guess. And the problem was that it was the strongest and it was a very, very expensive racket. And on the 4th, uh, 4th of June in 1996, it destroyed itself as 37 seconds after launch. And actually four satellites were destroyed with a loss of $370 million. Uh, so it was, uh, it was one of the world's most expensive software fault. Uh, and the reason was that uh actually there was an unsuccessful conversion between between 64-bit uh, and the 16-bit number but the underlying reason was that uh the modules were never tested together so they didn't test the whole system together and and it really emphasizes the need not just to model but to do some kind of verification. Verification, I mean that it can be either testing or, or formal verification, but we really need these kind of techniques. And just to show you uh, an example, there is the asteroid system. I, I'm sure that many of you have already heard about that. Uh, it's actually a very, very expensive tool because what it can do is it supports the specification and the modeling. And it has a very, very strong verification model that can do time stack analysis, uh, model coverage analysis, model checking, formally, formal verification. It supports rapid prototyping and executable specifications. And then from the formally verified, analyzed, tested software design, it can generate uh, code uh, for avionics, automotive, and for critical embedded systems. And what is important, and I will also cover here, it uses model checking and simulation and what we are also going to talk about is how we can do coverage analysis and uh, what we don't have time uh, unfortunately it's performance modeling so uh, in the model life cycle uh, there is a place to do uh analysis because you know we have the requirements specification hopefully and we want to do the analysis according to these things so whenever uh i uh i use model-based development then i can uh do the implementation after uh the verification of 
uh, are detailed models. And the promise of this approach is that if I have correct models, actually, I will have more correct code, or in cases when uh, I can prove that uh, my code generator uh, is, is correct, then I can say that, okay, it will provide correct code. So let's detail the basic concepts of models and activities that we might have uh, in, in this model-based development process. So at first, we have synthesis. Synthesis means that I have the inputs, I define the expected outputs, and the question is that which model is conformant to our specification. So we want to synthesize uh, the model itself. Actually, that's a very, very difficult task. But much easier is when I have the input and the model, and the question is if I have the correct output. So then we ask if the behavior of the model is good. And yes, certainly we have the control problem when I have the model and the expected output. And the question is that what uh, is then, uh, what is the input that I should provide to reach the desired uh, state? So that's the control problem. So may, mainly regarding models, these are the three different kinds of problems. And I'm sure that many of you are quite familiar with control problems. Synthesis, it's, let's say it's a difficult problem, uh, but today I will cover uh, the analysis questions. So uh, regarding correctness, uh, I want to say that, okay, correctness is when the model or the code fulfills the requirements. So, so I can talk about functional correctness when, there, when I have to satisfy functional logical requirements. But in many cases, I can have non-functional requirements. For example, I have performance requirement, reliability requirements, availability requirements. Uh, and in this case, I need to apply performance and dependability modeling. As I mentioned you, uh, in many cases, um, this kind of, uh, so if I have the functional model, I can create performance and dependability models just creating a view of this model uh, for the performance and reliability engineers, and they can just put their uh, information there. But today, uh, I will just talk about functional correctness. So that's uh, the goal of uh, today, where I want to say that uh, our implementation is error-free, so there is no forbidden behavior. And another very important thing is that uh, I have to show that my system will always be able to complete the tasks. Uh, that's also a very important thing. So whenever I uh, talk about functional requirements, so logical requirements. Uh, I can classify them. Uh, we can define LO behavior. I used to I used to call them safety behavior, and this is kind of something bad is never true. I will not reach something bad to happen. Uh, and the question is that what state can or can't be the current state of the system? and what behavior is prohibited. So they are usually universal requirements. What does it mean? 
they must always be true. And there is another category of uh, properties uh, that is called liveness properties, which are uh, telling some expected behavior. How, how can I define it or what kind of properties are these? Uh, for example, uh, I, I can say that uh, an expected behavior property is that something good eventually happens. So this is that this means that no matter what happens, uh, I will go to some state where uh, where uh, some expected things. Uh, so the question is, what states should be able to be reached, and uh, what functions should the system be capable of? And they are kind of existential requirements. That means that it is the possibility of fulfilling uh, some state. It is a kind of potential reachability. So just to see an example, for example, uh, even in traffic lines or in a crossroads, uh, we know that if I have a traffic light, if I have a crossroad and uh, one can go from this direction, this direction, if both direction I show green, there will be a crash here. So I shouldn't let uh, both cars to enter the crossroad. Uh, well, even actually, I see that it's uh, okay. In you know, in Brazil, I, I I see. Yesterday, I went home by Uber, and actually, uh, even though the traffic lights were red, I could cross everything. So I know it's. Uh, it's not enough to ensure that uh, somebody doesn't enter the crossing, uh, that the traffic lights are red. But anyway, in a hypothetically, uh, hypothetical world, I expect that uh, if the lights are red, then uh, the cars stop. So uh, I don't want this. Uh, this different roads to get green together because that's very, very dangerous. Uh, and regarding the expected behavior, oh, I have to remove this drawing here. So I can say that, okay, the light should be able to switch to green. That is also very, very important because otherwise, if you know all the traffic lights are red, then definitely our system doesn't work. So we cannot get to anywhere. So if you think about the differences, I, I, I told here that it cannot happen that all be green. Here I say that it should be able to become green. So this is, uh, these are the two different kind of functional uh, requirements. Actually, there are some more, but just for now it's enough. And also just uh, staying in this uh, crossroad example, I, I have to define uh, the property of deadlock, because how, how can I find deadlock? Deadlock is a subset of the state space which cannot be left by the system without external assistance. For example, when processes waiting for each other. So here you can see an example uh, where at crossroads, unless road signs or traffic rules tell otherwise, the vehicle coming from the right has right of phase, so he has the priority. But what ha happens, uh, well, actually that's in Hungary, maybe I guess it must be similar here, but uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. 
but so in this situation what what happens there are uh, somebody from all directions so if four cars arrive to the crossroad at the same time then one of them has to disclaim his priority and let the others go otherwise they will stay here forever according to highway code so if everybody just tells that okay after you after you after you that yeah everybody will just uh, follow the rules and and nobody can go to anywhere so we it's definitely uh, a problem so we need to unlock the de deadlock and we need some uh, uh, we, in many of the algorithms actually they they develop them to be asymmetric uh to not to get into deadlocks and there are so many algorithms with randomization uh for example in ethernet networks there is the back of algorithm so anyway there are many ways how we can avoid deadlock but we have to ensure in our system that there is no deadlock Deadlock is a very bad thing. You know, we show an example for deadlock that, uh, uh, so it's, it's sometimes it's not easy to see if there is a deadlock. Another kind of problem is live lock. That is a kind of infinite loop. So live lock is uh, another subset of the state space, which cannot be left by the system without external assistance. And that used to happen uh, when uh, we are unlocking the deadlocks. So they are, uh, when they are doing something, for example, uh, thinking or, or anything else, but that will not solve the problem of deadlock. So that, that used to reach uh, live lock when, when I want to solve deadlock problems. And actually, I need to find also live locks in uh, the system design. And there are quite powerful tools for that. Uh, I do not know if uh, Benz has uh, had, uh, shown you the, the powerful verification uh, tools in Gamma, but in Gamma you can find deadlocks, live locks, and many other things. So just to go back to deadlock, it's a common design mistake at parallel system. Uh, and often it is very difficult to avoid or unlock it uh, because in many cases, the solution believed to be good, good and also cause problems. And the problem with deadlock, it's very difficult to test. And we often uh, call it the multi-core CPU crisis where, where I have to, I, I really have to deal with, uh, with these deadlock problems. Uh, and such examples is when two processes have to exchange messages, but both are waiting for the other's message. Uh, or for example, both of two processes need two of the resources to continue, but each have reserved one. So there are many of these kind, and I will just show an example of communicating software components uh, that was presented in a Kotlin conference. I do not know if you are familiar with Kotlin. That's a very, very good uh, programming language, and it is very, very popular. And they, they just uh, had this service of process references when references are coming into queue. Actually, it's not a queue, but uh, you can imagine it as a clue, queue. There is a downloader component, and it will also uh, communicate with workers through actual not queues, but this is a kind of, um, I forgot the name, sorry, because I'm not a Kotlin expert, but uh, they are co communicating through these, uh, uh, these variables. And here you can see, the the source code of the download downloader and it receives uh the references uh and it resolves and it it sends this location to the workers that will uh actually 
work on that and send back uh, the locations with their contents. And the workers uh, download if uh, they have the location, then they, so the locations are arriving from here, they download the content and they have to send it back through these contents. And this is a kind of uh, program where uh, you can just put everything to different, uh, different uh, functions and it is quite nice uh, modular language so it, it, it provides you with all these nice things but actually this it will just put everything into one big program at the end and what you can see is uh, here is the state machine of the worker and the download downloader so the worker uh, uh, actually receives uh, location and then it works on that and it sends uh, and the downloader uh, it can receive locations and also it can send uh, answers uh, after each other so if it uh, if it receives the locations then it can send and whenever they show this very simple algorithm so you absolutely simple. Uh, it turned out that there is a problem. And if I just uh, took the formalism that you got to know before, uh, then we can do an analysis. So here on the top, you could see the worker. So this is the worker. And here is the uh, downloader. So uh, in the worker, uh, you just receive and then you send the content. And so you receive the location, send the content. And on the downloader, you also receive, but you can also uh, and, and send the finally uh, uh, content and and these are the basic steps. So just by signing with C, R, L, and here you can also see these things. So I, the, why I just showed this because you know a method to put these things together. And here you can see the channel. So these, the worker and the downloader are com communicating through this L and C variables. So what happens when I, I compose them together. So I put things together. Uh, everything is started from V0, V0, that's the initial location. And whenever I receive uh, a reference, uh, then I have to res resolve it and I have to send it to. Uh, to the uh, worker. So you can see that here D0 becomes D1. So that's the first step. Then I send an internal message through this. So that is something that I cannot observe from outside because I just see from outside the uh, R. And if I go there, I will reach this V1 D0 uh, state from which actually uh, the, I, I, the downloader has to receive uh, the content back. So I need the content. But what can happen is that if I is and the downloader can only get the content back when it is a in the d0 state so but if i receive more 
uh, reference. Then I will go to the V1, W1, D1 state. And there is no outgoing transition from here. So that's definitely a problem. So even using this very simple example, you could see that it's very, very important to verify things because uh, that's really just a couple of lines of code. And it's it's and actually it is uh, even not a multi-threaded program. So finally, the Kotlin just compiles everything into one code, and it will just go on one uh, one thread. But it can still go wrong. So so we really need this kind of analysis techniques, and I will talk about. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm just checking if there is any questions. Okay, not yet, so I can, but you can also ask at the end. But it's just a simple example. I just wanted to show you that, okay, they both have two, two states, so it's nothing, and it can still go wrong. So what uh, we can do is verification and validation. And uh, if we have the model and we have the requirements, then by using verification and valid validation, uh, we can prove that it is correct or erroneous. So for example, as a model, we can just uh, write a state chart or a, a data flow network of communication of bank and travel travel agency, and we can say that no message is lost and sooner or later the communication ends. So you see that uh, it shouldn't reach, this is a security where uh, message is lost. So we shouldn't reach such a situation. And sooner and or later, so we can reach a situation where the communication ends. So it's, just the combination of the two properties. And uh, there are different types of analysis. Uh, so by go, we can have verification, where I want to answer the question, am I building the system the right way? So the main question, if, if the implementation is conformant to the specification. And there's another kind of analysis uh, at a high level that is called validation. Uh, that tries to answer the question, if I am building the right system. So the question is that, does the system satisfy the user requirements? And by regarding methods, we can have different methods for the analysis. There are, we, we can have static analysis techniques and also dynamic analysis techniques, and we will just cover these uh, techniques today. Uh, I will talk about them later. So by using static analysis, for example, we can check uh, if the uh, process model is good or not. So here is a process model with the decision and then we have a join. So this is a decision and there is a join. So the, we just draw this, uh, this model, this process model. And the question is, if, it, if, this core is, if this model correct? And the problem is that if I have a decision, we talked about that, I will either go this way or this way. But when can I go from here? The join only continues when tokens arrive from all inputs. So by using some kind of static analysis, we can just feedback for the user that this model is not correct. It will not work it will actually go to that long. And believe me, it's, uh, I have seen it so many times in industrial partners doing this. 
Let's take another example of it for converge. So we have this model. Is this model correct? Actually, the problem is that uh, I will go in this case in both directions. And what happens here, it will just uh, transfer everything that arrives from here and from here. So it merge will let tokens pass through from any branch. It will doesn't synchronize. So it will lead to a situation where this test talk is executed twice. And I'm sure that this is not what the engineer wanted to do. So that's also something that we can find easily. And please, whenever you develop a process model, please don't do that. So I'm sure you learned that, okay, fork comes with a join, decision with a merge, and don't mix them. Okay, and let's take a closer look at another example. I just wanted to create a loop. So whenever I check it, I can go back here or either go this way. So it, it seems like a loop. Am I right? But the problem is that it's not a loop because the join only continues when tokens arrive from all inputs. That means that I need this input and also this input. But what can, when can I have this input? Only if I have reached this, but to reach this, I need this input. But I will never because to go here, I need this. So this is a kind of deadlock. It's, it's not nice. Please don't do that. And there's another example, another loop example. So I just put fork join. As I mentioned you, I should use them together. So, okay, at first sight, okay, I use them together. What can go wrong? Uh, but unfortunately it can also go wrong because join only continues when tokens arrive from all inputs. So even I used fork join together, it is still not good. And it will lead to a deadlock because I will always wait for this part. Okay, but let's use uh, another construct here, uh, merge. So, is this model correct? Because now merge will not go into deadlock. So, at first one can think about that it is correct. But you, I'm sure you remember that, okay, we always use fork join and decision merge together. But anyway, what can go wrong? So, whenever I go in this direction, I go here and that's completely fine. And then I will just produce uh, one more, go back here. But I will also go in this direction. So I will just uh, go to two directions in every iteration. And it is not often the case I wanted to do that because it will just produce again and again these post-processing again and again new frames. And well, do I want this? I'm sure not, because this is kind of a infinite loop. And what about now? So it will just produce new login after every login. 
and the session. And this fault implementation will produce many, many threads. And uh, if you remember, I talked about terminating nodes and so on. So I, I, I created, I, I have this model. Uh, and the question is, is the following model correct? And actually, it can be sometimes. But what happens when I publish points before completing this? Uh, actually, terminating node stops the complete process immediately. So it can happen that the other activity won't be executed. So what I miss here is a big join because I'm sure that whoever just had this in uh, their mind wanted to do both tasks. And uh, let me define well-structuredness for, uh, for process models. Because uh, actually one part well-structured processes that can be uh, analyzed uh, statically and if you follow these rules and if you will have a best structured process uh, and you will not have that those program problems that i mentioned uh, before so uh, in well structured processes we are building from control blocks with one entry point and one exit we can use sequence, but we can only use decision and merge together and fault join blocks together and loop separately and elementary activities. So it is quite similar to structured programming uh, where the control structure, we use control structures instead of go to uh, operations. So here you can see a non-well-structured process because here I have a decision merge, but between these, I combine them with other decision and merge. So they are overlapping. They, it's, I, I shouldn't do that in a well-structured process. If I would just put this here, somewhere inside this route, this uh, way, it would be good. But I cannot combine them in this way because it's not, uh, we have half of a decision merge between another decision merge. So uh, some formisms enforce well structured processes, for example, BPALs and uh, uh, and programming languages without go to break and so on. So uh, well structured processes should look like this. Uh, I have the allow pattern, so I can have activity start and activity final. I can put another activity into these two nodes. I can compose sequentially sub-processes. I can compose uh, in a decision merge uh, fashion the sub-processes. I can create loops with sub processes. And certainly I can use here uh, another rule and uh, compose sequentially inside these sub processes. Or either here. So I can also uh, put either sequential composition or I can put this whole sub process there. Or I can compose uh sub processes in a parallel way so either i have an empty process an atomic activity a sequence of processes uh, 
decisions, cycles, or define parallelism, but I can have them only in a way that when I want to put parallelism and cycles together, I have to put the whole thing here into the sub processes and don't mix them. Uh, yeah, so these, these are the, the rules for how we can develop uh, well structured process models. Uh, so we can do static analysis on data flow. So, for example, if we want to process multiple two, multi, want to process multiply two numbers, then the derived requirement is if at least one of them is even, the result will also be, and that can be traced through a, through the code by executing in mind. But we can use uh, symbolic execution that will that can do this instead of us. So symbolic execution means that instead of concrete values, values of variables, the program is executed with sets of possible values. So I, I use symbolic values. And this way we can define interesting inputs for internal branches uh, and we can find inputs that can uh, reach all the branches internal. So whenever, when I, whenever uh, I use uh, symbolic execution, I will have a wide range of test cases generated by this symbolic execution. It's a quite powerful tool. And also, a static analysis technique is when we use the syntax. Uh, when in syntax analysis, the modeling tools connect logically, cascading model elements. So whenever I define a clock, I will know that uh, whenever I use it in the model, what it is. And uh, syntax driven editors really help you by uh, finding all these problems that uh, by, for example, missing declarations or something like that can cause. And I'm sure that you are using such editors for programming. So uh, these editors used to uh, show you the errors very easily. And uh, the situation is that it can show you uh, during programming it is incorrect during editing. But in modeling, it uh, we can ensure that it is fully correct uh, regarding the syntax during the editing. And uh, we can also check the, the structural correctness. And that's also kind of static analysis uh, too. Uh, when we examine the model graph, so if you remember, I showed you that I have a program and I can make a process model of it. And uh, so we can use the model graph to find errors. And this is done by looking for error patterns during editing. For example, in, uh, in uh, state charts, uh, in finite state machines, uh, we can easily find unreachable states. So I don't have this edge here. I cannot go to post the state. So it is not reachable. So that's something that I don't want to see in a model. And uh, there are further analysis uh, possibilities. So for example, we can find missing initial states, that logs, variable assignments. Uh, not everything is done by static analysis, but most of them, in simple cases, most of them can be uh, detected uh, with the help of static uh, analysis.
Yeah. I just checked if there is any question. Yeah, so and and uh, with the help of static analysis, so we can also uh, provide supporting design, design guidelines, su such uh, thing that is called design patterns. So whenever I have a modeling tool, many of them lets you design uh, your own design patterns. And then these tools can analyze if uh, these design patterns are satisfied, or you can uh, add uh, uh, error patterns. And if that error pattern is present in the model, that's definitely a problem, and you want to find these problems. So all these things are very, very powerful. So maybe Benny just ben said, just showed you uh, that one can use a graphical editor in Gamma. And uh, for example, in, uh, in many cases, uh, we don't want uh, them to be used because that will lead to misunderstanding of the model. So we just define uh, patterns and we prohibit the application of these rules. Yes, so let's continue with testing. I, uh, I have also some slides for that. So how testing used to work? I have test inputs that are provided by the test executor to the system under test, and then I will receive the test results. Uh, how can I uh, do model testing? Uh, well, actually, any kind of testing. Uh, we need sometimes an oracle that will produce and compare the expected results. So I provide the test input both for the Oracle and the system under test. And uh, the output of the system under test is provided to the Oracle. And it will just compare somehow. We don't know how. Uh, but it will compare and uh, give a test result. Uh, but we can also use uh, reference in uh, testing uh, that will just define the expected output based on the test input. And we can just simply compare. So that can be some kind of uh, oracle by reference and, uh, and this comparison. Uh, and in case of uh, state machines, we can have uh, the test cases as input event sequences and expected actions and events. So if, if you want to test uh, in a state machine uh, way, then I have to provide uh, those things that I use for uh, using state machines. So actually, I will not show this example because uh, I'm just running out of time, but you can just check it at home. Uh, but I will also talk a little bit about uh, self-testing monitoring when uh, during uh, the running of the system, uh, I can uh, analyze the behavior of uh, the system under test or system under monitoring, actually. So we have the input invariants describing accepted and expected inputs. So that's the precondition. So I check the inputs. If the inputs are uh, not true, uh, the invariants are not true in the inputs, uh, I will just skip. Uh, because I'm not, I will just tell that, okay, I'm not interested in this anymore because my system is in a phase where I cannot ensure its correct behavior. And on the back, I had the output invariance, output invariance. Uh, 
that are describing the acceptable and the promised output. So it's kind of post conditions. And they also invariant, so all these invariants that I have either here or here, they must be continuously true. And whenever uh, I'm having the output of the system under test, then I will check uh, if the output invariants hold. So whenever uh, I, I, I did uh, testing with an external testing, I had all this test executor around my system under test. Actually, when I do self-testing, I will provide these things at the beginning and the end of the uh, system under test. And that's way by uh, telling what inputs I can accept and what expected outputs I can have, I do a runtime testing. So in in uh, external testing, I have a separate testing system, uh, but in this case, I have a single self-testing self component. So this way, we can put this on on board. Uh, and the typical application is a self-testing program. Where, for example, uh, I can provide preconditions. For example, here that the discrimin is non-negative. So that's a very, very important uh, thing. So I can define this precondition here, and I will go. I will give an ex, ex, exception because it's an unexpected situation, different, for, different from normal, and somebody else had to, uh, has to uh, handle it, because I cannot handle here uh, in this computation. And I have an assertion, uh, presumption, that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an error in a state that the code isn't prepared to handle. Uh, and the reason for that, there is incorrect implementation or runtime error. So here we just defined post condition that uh, my implementation had to fulfill. And by checking the post condition on my uh, outputs, I can decide if uh, if it uh, run correctly or not. And also regarding models, uh, we can also do testing, but it is usually done by simulation. So by executing the model and we can just analyze the behavior for a given input. In this case, the test case is a test input and we also need some outputs, expected define expected outputs. And the interesting question is that what inputs should be tested? So, you know, people just used to go there and put some random values. Okay, let's find out. Uh, but it's better if you have some, uh, some uh, leading some driving uh, measures that can drive me to test, uh, to do enough testing, to test the system uh, thoroughly enough. So what is that? What, we, what helps us to uh, develop good test suits, set of tests? And that is actually one of that can help us is, is, the, is the means of coverage, is the uh, metric of coverage. Uh, that is defined as coverage is the ratio of concern model parts during the execution of a given test suite. We can, for example, state coverage in state machines. So it's not called it state machines now, but you can even 
uh, generalize it to code, but I will talk about state machines right now. So if you just divide a number of rich states with all the states, and you will get some person, that you will get the percent of states that uh, are covered by the test suit. So when you execute the test, you see that which states are, are touched, on which state uh, the test goes through, and then you count them, and then you add sum up all the rich states, and then you divide it with all the states. But you can define transition coverage similarly by just counting, by just summing up the fire, the number of fire transitions, and divide it with all the the number of all transitions, and in, in the case of control flow, you can have the so-called command, command coverage, where you can just uh, sum up the execute the number of executed activities and divide it with uh, the number of all activities. So for example, just I, I will just go through this uh, uh, example, you don't have to understand it. I have a simple state machine with synchronous, dirty, and conflicting states. Uh, actually, it's about the client can write the file synchronized with the server and discard local modifications. And depending on the version of the replica on the server, uh, synchronizing may cause conflict if others have modified the file. So this is the conflict state can have dirty state, is write operation, discard operation, and so on. So it has, uh, this model has three states and six transitions. And I, I, I start to write test cases. So at first I write this card. And what is the coverage now? I actually, uh, the state coverage, I start from here, I go, through right to the dirty state. I, I actually, I covered 66% uh, of the states because from three, we covered two states. And what is the transition coverage? Actually, I, I covered one transition, this one, but I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so it's much less. Actually, it's not 33, but it's, uh, it's less, okay, uh, because I just, oh, sorry, I, I also discard, discard, so I also covered this one. So that's why from the six, I covered two, uh, just two. So that's 36, uh, uh, 33%. And I have another uh, test case, right? Server equals updated and synchronized and discard. And this way, I go to write. Uh, I know the service server updated and synchronized, so I can go here. I'm here, this, and I can also go to this card. So I covered all the states because I was here, and before that I also covered these states, and my transition coverage just increased to sixty six because. I haven't covered this one and this one. So I see that I have to cover those uh, transitions too. And then I can have third test case with all these elements where I can say that, okay, write uh, server updated, uh, synchronize, so I went to conflict, then I write, so I covered this one. I set server synchronous, and then I say synchronize. I covered the remaining uh, two transitions. So with this set of uh, test cases, I provided 100% coverage, uh, transition coverage. So this is how the coverage is increased from test uh, to test when I, I'm just going. So you can see that uh, whenever I, I have models and 
also in the case of cold. I can find some metrics that will definitely drive me through all the possibilities and they are very strong means to help us to develop tests. And uh, in software testing, as I mentioned, you we can uh, reuse such test suits. Uh, so whenever I have the model, I can use these tests to uh, not only to test the model, but also to test the software. And we can cover the test input because software can have very uh, complex test inputs. And uh, we can just observe the outputs of the model that will, uh, that will tell you the expected output. Okay, so uh monitoring so in so we can go to software testing but we also interested in monitoring in many cases so when we are doing monitoring then we are simulating the model while running the software and we gave the same inputs for the model and the program and we compared the outputs and that's good for fault detection uh, but we can also use uh, the monitor for log analysis so for example if i i cannot run my monitor uh, through with my software i can just know what the software did and i give the same input sequence and output some sequence for my monitor and i can compare them so i can use uh, models uh, for software testing before running uh, and while the software is running and also after uh, the software uh, was run. And also it's very important uh, question is the test documentation uh, because test cases and test results should be documented. But I guess uh, here you must do it because you are a big team so I will not go into these details uh, but I will just tell you some words about the different types and phases of tests so we start by model unit testing when uh, separate the components and test them alone then we we must have integration test when we are testing multiple components together so the first motivating example just showed that actually integration tests uh, were not done then comes the system test when we test the complete system together. And uh, when we find out that we have to, we have to change something, uh, then we will do regression testing. When we are selectively retesting our software, our uh, system after modifications. And in the remaining couple of minutes, I. Uh, I will talk a little bit about formal verification because I guess it's uh, it's good to know about that. Uh, I don't see any questions. So I will just uh... oh, I had a question maybe. Uh, how fast does a system failure in the program can be noticed by processing controls? uh actually uh i don't know which part of the presentation uh was the question but anyway uh you know so sometimes it's uh so the more fine grained your monitor is the more more overhead it will uh, it will yield for the system uh, but the easier and the faster the problems are detected so whenever for example if you have a software system running on a hardware then you can have hardware white dogs but that's a hardware uh, level uh, overhead but it can really easily point out if 
if even small problems uh so hardware errors and small software errors but if you if you just put the the verification the runtime verification far uh, in a, far from the source of the problem it will become uh, you you will get the problem you will find the problem later so that's uh, uh that that's what you have to think about to find a good balance okay i don't see other questions so i will just continue because i really want to show you formal verification so formal verification is used for proving correctness of models programs with mathematical methods and there are tools for that they are called model checkers that use the exhaustive examination of possible behaviors and uh, there are other tools that will, will provide automatic proof of correctness uh, such as automatic theorem provers automatic theorem provers are very strong they can prove very complex properties, but they are very, very difficult to use. And you can also use them for conformance testing uh, when you check the compatibility between models. So uh, in model checking, uh, as I mentioned, it's an exhaustive analysis of possible behavior of the model based on given requirements so it's very important that we have to provide requirements that's sometimes very difficult so we worked together an automotive company and they were developing super complex uh, steel by wire system and uh, it was really really difficult not only to model it but then to provide good requirements but finally when we could do that we found real problems in the design. Uh, so if we give all these things, then we will search for erroneous operations and they provide, so they will, these model checkers will give counter examples that can be used to show the erroneous operation. So testing will uh, just check the small set of possible cases why model checking is complete. So that's a big difference. Uh, testing checks the expected outputs while model checking checks the sequence of states. However, testing requires much less computation. Model checking requires more, 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 more computation. And testing can be used to find Bugs. It's a very, very good technique to find bugs. Uh, but model checking can also prove properties formally. So, and it works in a way that it uses state space generation. That means that we explore all the possible behavior and in practice if you remember the gamma tool it will calculate mixed products of the different state machines and that can uh, the number of states can go grow exponentially and the requirements are the expected properties of the state graph and in practice we use temporal logic expre expressions for that so I mentioned new state space generation. Uh, that means, let's say roughly, it's not completely true, but, but for, for us now it's enough that we are going to generate one single simple state machine from more complex models. So whenever uh, I have all these things, then we will just compute such as mixed products. Uh, 
and we will uh, trans for, uh, traverse these mixed products like here. So we have the door that you saw before from uh, Benz and the magnetron, and we can just compute the cross product, and that's what model checking does. And you also have to describe the requirements. That is, we use temporal logic for that. Temporal lo logic are to describe a set of states and we usually use predicates for that. I'm sure that you remember that Benz also mentioned predicates in many times. So we will use things like that to, to tell t is less than zero or temperature that is a variable is bigger than five and uh, we can use arbitrary predicates. And uh, so we describe a set of states, but we also have to describe the sequence of these states. How these states follow each other. So we use temporal logic for that. So a sequence of states in temporal logic, considering that I have the two predicates that P and Q, uh, when should P and Q be true? If I say that P should be true in the current state, then this is the sequence of state that I expect, and this is that the first element is P. We can say that it is true in the next state. Say it with the X that is from next. And that means that I'm starting here and the next, I will just make one step and there P is true. I can say that uh, P will be true in a future state. That is, I use F as future. That means I'm going, 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 and I'm here in a P. I can say that I need that P should be true in each state. That is globally. This G is for globally in every state, as you can see, P is true here, here, in every state. And we can also say that P is always true until Q becomes true. That is P until Q. And here you can see P, 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 P. And finally, it leads to Q. So, Actually, and you can just uh, combine combine everything together. So you can put uh, you can put uh, actually x and uh, f and g and until you can put them together. So that's how you can express. Uh, more complex properties. Uh, it's not easy sometimes when we just develop the um, property for uh, for this uh, industrial case study actually that was uh, three lines long because they we had so many F, G, until and so on. So sometimes it's not easy. You have to practice if you want to use it. Uh, but anyway, it is worth uh, learning. So now we saw how we can model the system. We could saw what kind of analysis we can run. And we also saw how we can uh, express uh, complex requirements. Uh, and I hope uh, we covered all uh, aspects of formal verification that we need to start uh, dealing with uh, models. So I will just finish right now because I run out of my time. 
Uh, but uh, we plan, as I mentioned you, we plan to have an advanced presentation. We will not do it today, but uh, we will uh, we will let you know that will be. Uh, we, I will show you some application examples, and uh, we will have maybe one and one and a half hour of uh, presentation, and uh, there we will show. Uh, case studies how we used in uh, industrial projects everything together and and there will be also a very interesting thing I will also show you uh, I mentioned you uh, system v2 many times because that's new generation systems engineering language and actually I have some colleagues who are one of the best uh people in that field so they are really an expert in system of v2 so we will also cover some topics and we try to help you if you are open to use these new generation tools we try to help you uh in getting started we will also show you some tools that are already are already available to support uh, not only uh, the the using the system of V2 in systems engineering, but also to do testing, test generation, and formal verification. And that's a very nice topic because what I will, what we will show you is that what, for example, in Boeing, they want to do in the future. So, uh, so it's quite interesting, and I will just also show you uh, a method a methodology that we developed uh, to make formal verification and formal analysis feasible in a practice because everything that I mentioned you here it's nice but it's very difficult especially the verification part is very difficult to apply because I guess you got to know the modeling language now so you can start modeling if you want and as i mentioned you if anybody wants to do it in the satellite domain just uh, write to uh, professor fatima Matiello, and we can organize uh, meetings and i can we can help you in uh, using these tools and help you in modeling but even if you are modeling things, it is sometimes difficult to use formal verification or dependability analysis and so on. But we can also help you doing that. And what I will show you in that next uh, presentation, it will be around that topic of, okay, how we did. And I really hope that we can help you to successfully apply all these things in your work or in your future work so uh i think that uh, you will get an email about uh, that presentation that will be also online and in that presentation you will also meet uh, professor uh, uh means molnar uh who is a huge expert on system v2 but for today I really thank your attention. I want to ask if you have any questions right now. Uh, I will send all the presentations and uh, you will be able to read, to get them, I hope, if, today or tomorrow. So, And I will also send all those presentations I haven't presented today because you can just go through that there are some examples. So they, I will I will make available everything for you. So do you have any questions? If there's no question, then uh, obrigado for uh, uh, some references to what? Because I sent so many, I, I talked about so many things, but I guess if I have to send references to everything, then you will just get a, uh, well, many page long uh, email from me. But I will make the slides available and I, I, I think that you will be able to, if you just Google something from the lectures, you will find uh, references and 
at work, but you can reach us also in email or through Professor Fatima Matiello. You can just write and we can discuss. And uh, we will be in uh, Brazil until the 3rd of July. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, next week we have to go to Natal. But for example, we are also available tomorrow here in NIMPI. We are in Sensoria building, so you can just find us there. Uh, so you, you can also find us personally. So, obrigado, and I hope uh, we can talk later and you will attend. I expect our presentation will be in two weeks because next week we will travel and we will have to uh, acclimate us to the things in Natal. So, obrigado and see you later.